So, Father God, we bless you today, and our hearts are warmed by that glorious truth we have just sang to you. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Because of that blood, we have now been adopted into the family of God. We are secured, having been sealed by your Holy Spirit. We've been given a future and a hope. None of this is by our own doing. It's not of works, we would boast. It is all of your grace, your grace that insults our sensibilities, that leaves us, Lord God, with nothing else to cling to but the old rugged cross. We thank you for that. Pray, Lord God, right now that we would never get so grown and sophisticated in our theology. that The simple truth of Jesus loves me, this I know, fails to move us. Wow us by that truth. So that in, Lord God, that I'm available to you to proclaim the glorious riches of your word. I'm not here, Lord God, to declare my opinions, my insights, my thoughts, You have not even promised to bless my illustrations, but you have said that your word will not return void. So I hold you to that promise today. Show yourself once again to be true to your word. May we leave here, Lord God, not just more informed. The evangelical community, particularly in the South, does not lack for information. Pray that we would leave here, Lord God, more inspired to be all that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name I ask, amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, please meet me in James chapter 5. I would like to spend a lot of time just saying thank you to you and the African-American tradition, that's what we do, but y'all have a brother on the clock this morning, so I don't have time to do that, but do let me acknowledge the fact that I am honored to be here in this great institution, at this great place, to declare unto you the Word of God. And so I want to say thank you to Dr. Hall and to all those who are instrumental in me coming here. We were in the green room, and I asked how much time did I have. That's a question I particularly like to ask. Uh, I asked it some years ago at a Presbyterian church in Charlotte, and I'll never forget what the pastor told me. He says, oh, dear brother, we are a spirit-led church. Time means nothing here. You take your time. Let the Lord use you. But the people leave at 12. (laughs) So I want to be sensitive to the time here. And yet there are some things that are heavy on my heart to share with you. What do I say to a group of individuals who are largely made up of students? As I prayed for what I should share with you, the Lord dropped in my spirit this word, found in James chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. I want to talk about patience. If you haven't mastered, you can leave. Patience. James writes, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, there's that word again, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also, verse 8, be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an, exa- as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained, synonym for patience, steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. and You have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. This is the word of the Lord. One of the most annoying things that could ever happen to an oyster is to have grain of sand lodged within its shells. 
For the most part, when an oyster experiences this, this oyster is able to locate that grain of sand and to expel it from its midst. But there are some rare occasions when this oyster will find itself having a grain of sand lodged inside of it, and it will try and try and try to expel this grain of sand, but it cannot. In moments like this, when this oyster is trying with all of its might to expel this grain of sand, and it can't do it, it will find itself irritated and frustrated and exacerbated. Here's this oyster doing all that it can. It, it can't remove it. And so now it does the only thing it can think to do to provide itself with a semblance of relief. We'll locate this grain of sand and we'll begin to coat it over and over and over with a liquid substance. Over time, that liquid substance that encases that grain of sand will harden, with the result being something that you and I value supremely, we will pay top dollar for. It's what we would call a pearl. Southern, at the end of the day, all a pearl is is the fruit of a very frustrated oyster. And yet that pearl would not come unless it experienced the irritating grains of sand. If you're in Christ, God wants to make a pearl out of your life. He wants to prop you up and make you a trophy of his grace. We have, after all, been saved by grace through faith, and we are, Ephesians 2, verse 10, his workmanship, his poema. God wants us to be pearls who display and radiate the glory of God in a dark and dying way, and we say, amen, make us your pearl, but what you may not realize is that God's method of making us into his pearls, his trophies of grace, only can be embraced by life's irritating grains of sand. There is no trouble. There is no trial. There is no difficulty. There is no frustration and irritation in this life. You will never become the pearl that God has ordained. Or to say it another way, you and I can never get to God's delivery room of blessing without first stopping and taking a respite in his waiting room called patience. Anyone in the scriptures that God has used for maximum effectiveness, maximum fruitfulness, have always taken time in God's proverbial wilderness. They have been individuals who, for a season of time, embraced ambiguity. They have been individuals who have been heartbroken, who have cried themselves to sleep. Sure, we may see the tip of the iceberg, but I would call your attention to look a little bit more closely, and upon further inspection, we will see the grains of sand that they encounter. We love Joseph, don't we? The longest narrative there in Genesis, here is Joseph, and yes, we see the pearl of Joseph, second in command in Egypt, but look closely at the grains of sand, betrayed and lied on by his brothers, left for dead, thrown into bondage, forgotten about in prison, the grains of sand. We love Moses, that legendary liberator and lawgiver, But look a little closer and you will see the grains of sand. Here is Moses, 40 years shepherding sheep on the backside of a mountain, embracing ambiguity. This once so-called prince of Egypt is now performing the lowly task, according to the Egyptians, of being a shepherd. 40 years, grains of sand. Now, I could call to your attention, David, 
Most scholars believe that from the time David is anointed the next king of Israel till the time he actually assumes the throne, 14, 15, 16 years go by. And in these years of ambiguity, there are sleepless nights. There are times when he's having to feign as a madman as he did in the city of Gath. There are times when he's on the run, he's forgotten about, and he's having to dodge spears from a deranged king. These are grains of sand. It's Jesus Christ on a lonely Friday night with literally the world hanging on his shoulders. It's the Apostle Paul sitting in yet another jail cell, chained to the praetorian guard. All I'm trying to say is you and I will not experience God's pearl in our life without first of all embracing life's proverbial grains of sand. Anyone that God has used mightily, God has allowed them to sit in his waiting room, forgotten about, heartbroken, We've all got them. Your grain of sand may not be my grain of sand, and my grain of sand may not be your grain of sand. But as my grandmama used to say, all God's children have their own grains of sand. And it's against this backdrop that we come to our text. Here's James, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the anatomy of patience. From there, he's going to move to the analogies of patience. And then finally, he's going to conclude with the aim of patience. This whole text is consumed with this notion of patience. James begins with what we would call in the Greek construction an imperative. He begins by saying, be patient. The idea of an imperative, you know this, it's a command. And implicit in this command, this imperative is the idea of urgency. One of the peculiarities of the epistle of James is is its high concentration of imperatives. You can scarcely read a verse in the epistle of James without running into this notion of imperatives. Again, the idea of imperatives, it is the idea of a command, and when you make a command, there's implicit the idea of passion. It's the idea of urgency. It is as if James is grabbing us by the proverbial lapels, looking us in our eyes, and he is saying, be patient. James is not suggesting. This is not some little tweet that he's giving for you to ponder or consider. James is commanding all of us, leasing time on God's green earth, be patient. The Greek word for patient is a compound word. It simply means to be long or slow to anger. Implicit in this idea of patience, long or slow to anger, is the idea that I have found myself in a situation I do not like. It was the noted theologian D.A. Carson in his wonderful book, Scandalous, who makes a side remark. He says, herein lies the reason we don't pray for patience. The reason why we don't pray is, is because we are astute enough to acknowledge that the very petition for patience assumes that I will be placed into a situation I don't like. James is commanding us, be patient. He wants us to understand that there will be situations and scenarios and circumstances in life where we will become at our wit's end. There will be situations in life that will drive us crazy. There will be times in this life where we feel like we've got one nerve left and you are break dancing all over it. Oh, yes. You keep inhaling and exhaling and you'll be right there. I got a dear friend of mine, he was right there just a few weeks ago. He called me, and I could hear it in his voice all the way in California, and he's telling me about how they just diagnosed his mother with breast cancer, and she's got to have a double mastectomy, and on top of that, they found tumors on his spine. And as if that was not enough, his house that was up for sale had a contract on it, and in the 11th hour, the buyer pulled out. You could hear it in his voice, I can't take it any more.
I've been there. I've got a kid that I've got to shuttle to St. Jude's Hospital monthly. Children's Hospital there that diagnoses kids with cancer and deals with them. And I I sit literally in waiting rooms next to five-year-old kids with bald heads. There's no cure yet for my boy. I'm there. I know what it's like to to have a child endure this and wishing there was a quick fix and there is no quick fix. Same time, my wife and I are wondering if one of our kids is saved, we don't see any fruit in his life. And in the middle of all that, I've got to preach and teach and pastor and lead. Pastoral ministry does not give you a loophole into this. We are, as Henry now and oftentimes calls, wounded healers. In the middle of all this, James says, be patient. I love what now he says right there in the aftermath. He says, be patient, therefore, brothers. Don't miss this. Don't miss this until the coming of the Lord. If I was in a chocolate church, this would be some shouting right here. (laughs) He says, be patient until the coming of the Lord. This phrase tells us that whatever it is you're going through in this life has an expiration date. The very fact that he says, until the coming of the Lord, tells me as the old Negro spiritual says, trouble don't last always. That whatever it is I'm going through, that the very nature of this life is temporary, which means there's only two places in the universe where you and I will never need patience. We will not need patience in heaven because there is no adversity. And we will not need patience in hell because there is no exit sign. But we do need patience in this life because this life is temporary. As Hebrews 9 says, it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Uh, He's not saying that your situation will work out the way that you want it to work out. He's not saying your situation will end the way that you want it to end. But he is saying it will end. The cancer will end. The financial hardship will end. The season in seminary will end. The marital difficulties will end. Be patient, he says, until the coming of the Lord. So now he moves to the illustration. His point is clear. I want you to be patient. I want you to be long or slow to to anger. But now he says... In the middle of verse 7, interesting illustration for patience. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also, verse 8, be patient. It's interesting he would use the analogy, the imagery of a farmer to indicate patience. Here's a farmer. He walks out onto his field. It is barren. There are no crops. There are no fruit. And the farmer does not just sit here and go, God, I'm waiting on you. God, do something. No. What the farmer does is he goes to his field and he plows his field. He works day and night, sun up to sundown. He he, he scatters seed in this field. He tends this field. He works and he works and he works all the while knowing that unless God sends the rain, his labor is in vain. Patience, James wants us to understand, is not passive resignation. Patience, according to this illustration, is active waiting. It is doing all that I can with the power and might and gifts that God has given me, knowing that I am at the end of the day dependent on God to send the rain. Patience is active waiting. The clearest biblical example of this is the Apostle Paul. We know that this man who wrote 13 of the New Testament's letters... 13 of the New Testament's books, many of those epistles that he writes, he is sitting 
in jail. He's in his own kind of waiting room, and yet while he's there, he's not just waiting for God to perform a jailbreak like he did in Acts chapter 12. I'm waiting, send the earthquake, God. Instead, what Paul does is he gets a pen, gets some, gets some papyrus, and he writes, and he writes, and he writes, and he writes. But, but not only does he write, you read any of his letters and you hear him say things like, I've been praying for you. He writes and he prays. But not only that, in writing to the Philippians, in Philippians chapter 1, he, he says, I want you to know that the gospel has gone forth throughout the whole praetorian guard. It, it hits him one day that he's chained to these guardsmen, and because of that, he's not going anywhere, and they're not going anywhere. They're stuck with each other. And so he turns to his right and says, Jesus, 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 and turns to his left and says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Paul's waiting room was not passive resignation. It was active waiting. I was on a plane to Chicago not too long ago, and right when we got to the city, the pilot decided to offer us an unsolicited aerial tour of the city. We kept going around and around and around and around. In the aeronautics industry, this is known as a holding pattern. We're going around and around and around and around, and I'm getting irritated and frustrated like that oyster, wanting this pilot to land this plane. I got a schedule to keep. There's stuff that I have to do. I got to hurry up and preach at this church, and here we are going around and around and around in a holding pattern. I couldn't do anything. So I unbuckled my seatbelt, took my laptop out of my bag, and I worked, and I worked, and I worked, and I worked. That's what James is getting at here. When he appeals to the farmer, he is not saying that patience is passive resignation. It is active waiting. There's something else here to the anatomy of patience. It's not just adversity. It doesn't just, um, uh, it's not just active waiting. But thirdly, it entails our attitude. Verse 8, you also be patient. Establish your hearts, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Or, or, or excuse me, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Verse 9, do not grumble. Interesting. These words conjure up images to the Jewish readers of their forefathers in the wilderness. Murmur, 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 grumble, grumble, grumble. And their attitude betrayed their lack of patience, which is what delayed, in many cases, forfeited many of them from the promised land. But the wilderness journey and what our passage reveals is that patience is not just physical, it's attitudinal. You can be patient with your body, but if you are impatient with your attitude, you are impatient. He says, don't grumble. Don't murmur. Don't complain. That, 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 that you should have its antithesis. You should have a sense of joy. And as long as there's Jesus, there should always be joy. I'm an Atlanta Falcons fan which means I'm a man of character because I'm well acquainted with suffering. I love the Falcons. The epitome of my experience as an Atlanta Falcons fan was in uh, 1998 when my Dirty Birds, led by Jamal Anderson, made it to the NFC Championship game against the Minnesota Vikings. I remember that Sunday working in the Atlanta Falcons into my benedictory prayer. God, give them favor and they won. James would go on to say in this text that the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. <laughs> I was happy. And I was talking a lot of trash. We were going to the Super Bowl. We were going to win. And, of course, the Denver Broncos won. But that's okay because 1998 was a great year, but 1999 was going to be a better year. And I'm talking all kinds of trash. We're going to have this great year, all kinds of trash. I'm talking 1999 is going to be our year. And then it happened, one of the first games, Monday night football game, Jamal Anderson, our star running back, cut one way and blew out his knee. That was the end of the season, and now folks are calling my house, I don't even know, talking about, Pastor, what happened to you, dirty birds? 
Here it is, 1999, I'm frustrated, my Falcons are losing, I'm down in the dumps, my attitude is just completely gone, and in the middle of 1999, I got an ingenious idea. I decided to pick up the phone and call NFL Films and ask them in 1999 to send me the 1998 highlight reel of the Atlanta Falcons. This proved to be therapeutic for my soul. Because of 1999, when I'm frustrated with the Atlanta Falcons and turning off the game with 14 minutes and 12 seconds left to go in the first quarter, I would then go downstairs to our basement and pop in the highlight reel in 1999 of the 1998 Atlanta Falcons, and it would be that reflection on the past days of the Falcons that would give me joy in the present. All I'm trying to say is if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you ought to have some nothing but Jesus highlight films. That no matter what it is you're going through in your present, you should always be able to look at the rearview mirror of your journey with Jesus and conclude he has been good, he has been faithful, he has seen me through. As long as there's Jesus, there should be joy. James says, be patient, not just with your body, with your attitude, do not grumble. Now, beginning in verse 10, he now moves from the anatomy of patience, which is adversity, active waiting, attitude, to now quickly the analogies of patience. He says in verse 10, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. My youngest son, Jaden, man, he's, he's my retirement plan. Kid is huge and big. His spiritual gift is eating. I've already got it worked out. When Jaden comes to me in his 20s and he says to me, Dad, I've fallen in love, and how do you know she's the one? I don't know what I'm going to tell him. Jaden, if you can look into her eyes like you look into my refrigerator, she's the one. (laughs) The kid's big, and he's gifted athletically. He's a great basketball player, and what does Jaden do for inspiration? He gets posters of his favorite players and Derrick Rose and all of these wonderful NBA players, and he keeps them around him, and he's constantly looking to them. In our text, it's as if James is saying, here are your poster children for patience. Surround yourself with their presence. Look to them, and who are they? They're the prophets. Time does not permit me to get into all of them, but one of the things we glean from the prophets, they are poster children for patience. God shows up to Ezekiel, and he says, Ezekiel, I want you to literally eat this scroll. And he eats it, and his stomach turns bitter. And he says, Ezekiel, if that's not enough, undress, get naked, and lay on your side for 390 days. Patience. Comes to, to Hosea, and he says, Hosea, I want you to go to the south side of town and marry a girl named Candy kind of what her Hebrew name means. (laughs) Marry this girl, Gomer. She's going to break your heart. She's going to break the covenant. And when she does, go and get her back. Don't divorce her because I need to use you and that experience to give a visual demonstration of my hased, my steadfast love over my people. Patience. Daniel, I'm going to hide you in this lion's den all night long. You'll be fearing for your life. Patience. Patient. When going through, we need some posters to look at. But the epitome of the posters now comes in verse 11 when he says, Behold, we consider those blessed who spoke in the name of the Lord, uh, who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness that is the patience of Job. My, my, my. Job is a picture of patience. You thought 2008 was a rough time economically. It had nothing on the economic downturn in Job in the opening chapters. He loses all that he has. Messenger upon messenger is giving him bad news. As if that's not enough, he loses his kids and he goes to a funeral, not just with one casket, but with ten caskets in each casket holding the, the corpse of one of his kids. As if that's not enough, he's covered from head to toe with boils. And if that's not enough, seen through the eyes of a man, the worst part to me is to go through all of that and to have a wife chirping in your way, in your ear, a dripping faucet saying, curse God and die, curse God and die, curse God and die. Through it all, 
Job is the picture of patience. He says with confidence, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. The most astounding thing is this man, fresh out of the funeral, covered with boils from head to toe, says an astounding statement in Job chapter 19. In Job chapter 19, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. This is amazing. When you see it against the backdrop of his feelings, Here's a man who is feeling pain. Here's a man who's feeling down. Here's a man who's feeling depressed. And yet, in spite of his feelings, he says, I know. If you get nothing else, I say get this. When you are going through life's trying circumstances, Brian, when you are driving to St. Jude's for yet another round with the doctors, always let what you know trump how you feel. I feel depressed, but I know he lives. I feel discouraged, but I know he lives. I feel down, but I know. I know he lives. James says, I'm not recommending, I'm not suggesting when life's grains of sand hit you, be patient. That's the anatomy of patience. It is adversity. It is active waiting. It is your attitude. The analogies of patience are the prophets. Thirdly and finally, in our last two minutes together, there is an aim to patience. Verse 11, behold, we consider those blessed who spoke in the name of, uh, who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job. Here it is. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord. How the Lord is compassionate and merciful. You have seen, you have seen, you have seen the purpose of the Lord. What you are going through is not coincidental. What you are going through is not happenstance. The infertility you're battling with is is not just some random roll of the dice. There is a purpose. Your waiting room is custom made. God will not put more on you than you can bear. And he has an aim in the trial. Growing up, my mama, her hobby was cross-stitching. Some of us know what cross-stitching is. It involves taking a piece of cloth and weaving through it a pattern of threads. And I'll never forget being a little boy. My mama would cross stitch on the sofa and and I would sit at her feet, which means me sitting at my mama's feet while she cross stitched means I was looking at things from the bottom up. If you've ever watched someone cross stitch from the bottom up, it's, it's, it's a scenario of chaos and craziness. From my perspective on the floor at my mama's feet, all I saw was a mess of uh, jumbled, dangling threads. It made no sense. There was no rhyme or reason. And I remember one day saying, Mama, Mama, what are you doing? It doesn't make any sense. And she patted the sofa and said, Son, sit down next to me. When I sat down next to Mama, I was no longer looking at the situation from the bottom up. I was now looking at it from Mama's perspective from the top down. Now what I saw were not a a, a mess of dangling threads. I saw a beautiful pattern emerging. The problem with this life is we see things from the bottom up, and it makes no sense. It has no rhyme or reason, but there are times in the text when God says, sit on my lap. All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Sit on my lap. He who began the good work will be faithful to complete it. Sit on my lap. There's a name. Be patient, Job says. Be patient. Father God, I've tried to be faithful to the text. And to steward these moments that we have together in such a way that you are glorified and your people are edified. Pray that your precious Holy Spirit will take this word and apply it in specific ways to each of our hearts and lives. 
We may not be going through it now, but I do pray that when life's grains of sand hit us in the future, that we will recall this word to mind, and it will have the desired effect not just on our bodies, but on our attitudes. It's in your name we ask. Amen.